All right, it is good to be together to worship our God together. Grateful that you're here. If uh, if you're new here, um, welcome. You picked a great week to come. And uh, as not only as we worship God as we gather here, we're wrapping up a, a series that's been really encouraging to be a part of. We've got all the stuff going on outside in the south wing looking for opportunities to connect. So you'll hit that after the service. Don't get up right now and go out there. Uh, just hang with me for a few more minutes. And then after the service, we'll head out there. And this is uh, what it means to be us together. All right? So we're, we're learning those things as we walk together. I'm grateful that you're here and a part of it. If you're new here and we haven't met, my name is Matt. I'm uh, just one of the pastors here and love to be able to pray with you and serve you and help you connect with what God is doing here. So let me know how I can do that. All right. Um, I want to pray for us as we get ready to jump into our message and uh, then, then we'll read scripture together and learn together. So let's pray. Father, uh, wow, it is just great uh, to worship you. Um, I'm encouraged as I worship you. I suspect I'm not the only one. So thank you for the opportunity that we have to do that, that you have uh, rescued us through your son, Jesus. You have called us your own by your grace. That we stand before you forgiven and free and filled with your spirit. God, that's the, the life that we want. We want life in you. We want to walk with you. Um as you lead the way. And so help us to do that. Even as we study your word, may the same spirit that inspired these words be the spirit that makes them come alive to us today. Father, we ask that you would open our eyes to see what we don't normally see. Sometimes our eyes are just closed. We we miss it. God, would you, by your grace, open our ears to hear what we so easily miss and are deaf to. Um, Sometimes we're just so distracted by all the white noise in our world and we don't hear, but we want to hear. Give us ears to hear. And God, give us hearts that are humble and soft and teachable in your care. Sometimes we're just so stubborn. Uh, But soften us, soften our hearts by work of your grace, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're coming to the close of this series, Beautiful Feet. Is anybody convinced yet that feet are beautiful? Yeah, sometimes they're still a little bit gamey, aren't they? Oh, we're not so sure. You know, we've been here long enough that the, the notion of feet has kind of blended into the background for us. So we're not paying that much attention to us. But, but scripture says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And these are feet that have been worn and calloused and bloodied running through the hills, proclaiming the good news of God. The arrival of his kingdom through Messiah. The availability for all people of all nations to join him, to be a part of his life through the forgiveness of sin and the filling of his spirit. This is the good news that is proclaimed high and low. And as we run throughout the world, our feet get banged up and bloodied and cut and splintered and calloused. At first glance, anything but beautiful. But let's remember, beautiful are the feet of the ones who bring good news. Your feet are beautiful as you bring good news into your school. Your feet are beautiful as you bring good news into your business. Your feet are beautiful as you bring good news into your home. Your feet are beautiful as you bring good news into your neighborhood. They may look battered and cut and bruised and callous, but man, those paws are beautiful because they bring good news. And this isn't anything that we make up on our own. We, we find ourselves woven into a story that began generations ago. This is what Acts gives us. What does it look like for people to follow Jesus faithfully into the world having beautiful feet? And so today we find ourselves in the last chapter of Acts. 
Acts chapter 28. For much of Acts, we've, we've looked at uh, the journey, the, the epic journey of this man named Paul. And here we are, Acts 28. I want to read beginning at verse 17. All right? Acts 28, beginning at verse 17, and then we're going to take it right to the end. Got to read those last words. So we find Paul here. We're going to talk about his context in just a moment, but let's just read beginning at verse 17. Three days later, he called Paul, called to gather the local Jewish leaders. Now, when they had assembled, Paul said to them, my brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But the Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I'm bound in this chain. And they replied, we've not received any letters from Judea concerning you. And none of our people who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. Uh, But we want to hear what your views are. For we know that people everywhere are talking about this sect. Now they had arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. Uh, He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining all about the kingdom of God. And from the law of Moses and the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, so this little section he's quoting from Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For the people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. and They will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Notice there's no phrase there that says, the end. If we were to put real good punctuation on this, we'd say with all boldness and without hindrance, dot, dot, dot. For the mission continues even in our day. So what was Paul's situation here? What, what, what led him to this place? As we look at Paul's story, we see that there was incredible suffering on his journey here. From from the road to Damascus, where Jesus knocked him off his horse and spoke to him and blinded him, all the way to this point that we find him under what would be considered house arrest, awaiting his audience before the emperor, before Caesar. And all along this way, there was great suffering. He was called, commissioned to be a part of the the spreading of the good news. So he suffered the hand of accusations. He was hauled before a number of times. He was hauled before uh, ruling councils, Jewish ruling councils, and accused of blasphemy leading people astray. He had threats on his life. There were people who swore that when he was transferred in prison, transferred from one space to another, they would intervene and kill him and then would finally be done with this Paul. He had threats to his life. He withstood riots. 
people were so angry with the stuff that he was doing. They were literally like rioting in the streets. Like imagine if Philadelphia would, would have won the Super Bowl. Like we get a glimpse of what riots are, but this is like what Paul was in the center of. Like he withstood all of these things. And even in his journey, just recently before this, he was shipwrecked, just trying to get from Jerusalem to Rome. He was shipwrecked. And everybody on board survived. Like God had spoken to him, like you're going to survive, everybody on board is going to survive. So everybody survived the shipwreck and they found themselves onto a beachy island as the ship was torn apart by the winter waves coming upon them. And they all crawled ashore. They accounted for everybody there. And none of the other prisoners that were being in transport had escaped. Whew, that was pretty good. And so they were building a fire, right? So he survived riots, accusations, threats against his life, shipwreck, disaster. And he's building, I just want to build a fire. And as he reaches into the brush, do you know what happened? A viper comes out and snatches him by the hand. <laughs> Are you kidding me? just trying to build the fire. And so people were like, ooh, he must be cursed. He shook the viper off into the fire and nothing happened. And then people changed their tune. Like, oh, we thought he was going to die. That was a sign of God's judgment. He didn't die. He didn't even swell up. He must be a God. <laughs> and so they were willing for him to be counted among their pantheon of gods. Like this is Paul's life. And it's showing us that the gospel is on the move throughout all the world. Throughout all the world. And it's going to meet incredible opposition. It's going to include suffering. The, the suffering of the mission is not a bug, it's a feature. It's something that God is using to advance his purposes. The very things that we think will, will hinder, that will stop the mission of God are the things that God uses to propel it forward because God's economy is different than our economy. God's math is different than our math. And so as we sit here in this day, we look at a world around us that is increasingly antagonistic and oppositional to the good news of Jesus. And in the very moments that we might, we're not sure if we should just be a little bit quieter, that we should shrink back, or should we be more and louder? God says, it's my mission and it moves forward. And in the midst of the suffering and all the different shapes that it takes, in the midst of the opposition and all the different shapes that it takes, the mission moves forward. And so Paul's story brings us to this place where we're understanding it. And so here he is as a Roman citizen who has appealed to Caesar. You heard that in the piece that we read there. He was being accused in Jerusalem by his own people, by the Jews, uh, of crimes worthy of death. And the, uh, the Roman authorities there didn't want to touch him. They're like, or not, like, not it. That's kind of what they did. And so he appealed to Caesar uh, to stand before Caesar, which is beautiful because his calling was to bring the gospel of Jesus to the Gentiles. And here he is leveraging his citizenship, not for his own rights and protection, but leveraging his citizenship for the mission that he might stand before Caesar, ruler of the known world, and proclaim the lordship of Jesus. And we see in this, uh, just before this section here, you can go back and read it for yourself. He finally, after all of this stuff, he makes his way into Rome. And there's something reminiscent about his journey into Rome. Here's this massive city. It was the largest known city in human civilization at that point, approximately a million people. And it was congested and so many people and so many people living there. And most of the houses, housing was, was stacked on top of each other, kind of tenement housing there. And so we get this picture of Paul arriving into Rome, but word had spread before he got there to the believers. Now, Paul had never been in Rome before. Take that in for a moment. And yet there were believers who were already there. And the word was spreading among them that the apostle Paul, Paul is here, Paul is coming, let's go meet him. And so they come out to meet him. There's this triumphant dynamic. There's no donkeys and cloaks and those kinds of things, but there's this triumphal uh, entry, if you will, into Rome. And it's, it's creating for us these echoes, like we've heard this before. 
We've heard this before as Jesus came into Jerusalem. Now, Paul is not Jesus. That's why we get just echoes of this. But the mission of Jesus continues. And so we get these, these pictures painted for us of how that mission continues. It's nothing of Paul's own doing. It's nothing of Paul's own imagination. It's continuing what Jesus began. And so as Jesus experienced persecution and opposition, here's Paul experiencing persecution and opposition, dot, dot, dot. We ought to expect some level of persecution and opposition, right? And yet there is triumph, there is victory right there in the midst of it. And so Paul finds himself in Rome. And so he talks about, uh, here Luke uh, tells us right towards the end that he's uh, in the house that he has rented. Because he's a Roman citizen, it, it wasn't like he was just moving to New the city and he's, you know, been to Ikea and he's decorating this fancy new apartment that he's got for himself and he's, uh, he's a townie now. This isn't what's going on with Paul. He's, he's still under arrest. He's, he's chained uh, and he's awaiting audience with Caesar. Uh, but Caesar, who cares who this guy is, right? So he waits and we get at least two years here. And so he has to find his own place. Because he's a Roman citizen, he doesn't have to be in a prison, in a dungeon. He's able to, if he can afford it, uh, rent a place. But it's got to be big enough for him. It's got to be big enough for the the soldiers who are guarding him. And so he has to make uh, these kinds of arrangements for himself. It was probably in the second or third floor of like these tenement places in this bustling city of Rome. And so this is where Paul is holed up. He can't go out. That's why he talks about people coming to him. Because he can't go anywhere. He's under house arrest. He can't go. He's literally in a chain. And he chained two guards. And the guards rotate. And we even learn in some of his other letters that those guards, some of them have come to faith in Jesus because here they are. They're trapped with him. Can you mean, like, not being a believer and then literally chained to the apostle Paul? right? He's hearing this stuff. And and so we learn that God moves even through the chains of Paul. And Paul knows that God is moving even in his chains. So this is what's going on there uh, in this house arrest in Rome. And so as he settles into this space, he uh, knows that there's uh, Jewish communities there. Of course there are. Um, And so he calls for some of the leaders to come with him. And that's what we find in verse uh, 23. Um, He's meeting with these uh, Jewish leaders. We get this, um, you know, at 18, 19, uh, 20. He wanted to see you. Um, and, and they're all like, well, we didn't get any letters about you. Like Paul's saying there was this ruckus in Jerusalem. Like, we didn't hear about this. We, we want to hear more. So then they come back and they get more uh, leaders. So they're, they're packing in here. Now, it's Paul speaking. So I'm just really curious if they got the news and if anybody finds himself sitting in a windowsill while he's preaching. Maybe not. Like, don't sit by the window once Paul gets going. I'm not sure. But they're meeting in his house and gathered with him. And so what is he doing? Well, again, look at 23. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day, and they came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. That's just such a nice way. It's in the place that he was staying. Uh, He's imprisoned. Uh, He witnessed to them from morning till evening... Maybe he learned his lesson. It wasn't way into the evening past midnight. Explaining to them, listen to this, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. He's explaining the Hebrew scriptures to them and he's explaining how the the expectation of Messiah is woven through all of Moses' writings, the prophets, the, the scriptures. And so when Paul uses that phrase, he's talking about what we would have as, as our Old Testament. The Hebrew scriptures are all pointing towards the coming of Messiah. And what he's showing is that Jesus is Messiah. So as faithful Jews, they would have said, yeah, Messiah is coming. God has promised Messiah. He's going to come someday. And Paul is saying, Jesus is the one. He is the answer. He is the one that God has promise he is Messiah and so he's explaining to them going back through the scriptures and uh, again this might be an echo for us of something that rings a bell you remember Jesus after his resurrection walking on the road to Emmaus and the two disciples didn't recognize that it was Jesus 
and he explained to them from the scriptures what would take place. And then after they knew it was Jesus and then Jesus was gone, they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us? See, God has revealed himself through the scriptures. God has shown us who he is and how he's at work. And we still have these scriptures, Old and New Testament, inspired by God, carrying the weight of God's word before us. And so the anchor point of this mission, the biggest tool that we have is the scripture that has been inspired by the spirit, filled with the spirit that helps us understand it and proclaim it. And so even the apostle Paul wasn't making it up on his own. He wasn't making it up on the fly. He went back into the scriptures to explain who Jesus is. And he was revealed as Messiah. And he does so anchored around this phrase, the kingdom of God. He explains the kingdom of God. This is a phrase that we hear a lot um, throughout the scriptures. And it's one that often feels foreign to us. But Paul is explaining this over and over and over again with Jesus. And what he's explaining, when we hear the kingdom of God, this is what's being proclaimed here. That through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the rule and reign of God has begun. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the rule and reign of God has begun. Because even uh, throughout human history, people have asked in different ways, Who's in charge here? And different people have worshipped pagan gods by trying to appease these pagan gods who when they're angry, things get messed up and when they seem to be appeased, things, to, things seem to be going better. But humans, whether they believe in God or not, are asking, who's in charge here? And the kingdom of God proclaims that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the reign and rule of God has begun. It's begun. And sinners, those who have been enemies of God, who have stand opposed to God, are welcomed into the kingdom. This is remarkable. When the new king comes, these people are used to, when the king shows up, he destroys his enemies. But in the kingdom of God, God does something different. He calls his enemies to himself and opens the door for enemies to become family, and he does so through the forgiveness of sin, won by Jesus on the cross. Jesus became king in the most unlikely of ways, and it is an unlikely kingdom. It's a mystifying kingdom, it's a confusing kingdom because it doesn't work the way every other kingdom in the world has worked. But this is God's kingdom where God reigns and God rules. And to live in the kingdom is to live under the lordship of Jesus now and forever. The kingdom of God is just not a someday reality. It has already broken into the darkness and wickedness of this world. The kingdom of God has arrived. The kingdom of God is at hand. This is what Jesus proclaimed. The kingdom of God is at hand. The rule and reign of God has begun through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And it has begun. And so we live under the lordship of Jesus now. And what does scripture teach us? Forever into eternal life. Eternal life is not just about duration. It is that. But it's also about quality. That under the lordship of Christ, there is peace. Under the lordship of Christ, there is joy. Under the lordship of Christ, there is love. Under the lordship of Christ... There is flourishing the way God intends. And the only way into this space is through Christ. And so the call is continually to repent and believe. The kingdom of God in its eternal life is experienced as his presence, his joy, peace, and love. And remember, that which is partial now will be eternal after his return, after Christ's return and judgment. That which is partial now will become eternally full after his return and judgment. 
So we can taste it now. We can live under his lordship beginning even now. And this is what the kingdom of God proclaims. This is what Paul spent morning till evening proclaiming to his Jewish brothers. And then to any who would come and visit him. And it's interesting. Look at how they responded. Verse 24. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul made this final statement. So the Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah, the prophet, we have this in Isaiah chapter 6. The prophet says this, inspired by God's spirit, go to the people and say, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For the people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. For if they were not deaf, if they were not blind, they would see with their eyes hear with their ears and understand with their hearts. And if they saw and if they heard and they understood, they would turn. And if they turned, I would heal them. God was speaking generations before. And here Paul is saying it's happening right here in our midst. He's saying to those who were gathered in his apartment that day, they, they had the prophets, they had Moses, they had the scriptures, they had this passed down to them. But not all of them heard, not all of them saw. And so Paul in this moment and Isaiah generations before through the inspiration of the spirit would call out this reality. And this itself is a pronouncement of judgment for judgment has come to stubborn hearts we see their response some believed and some walked away that is always true when it comes to the gospel of Jesus there will be those who will believe whose hearts are soft whose ears are open whose eyes can see and there will be those who are stubborn and blind and deaf. That's always true. And notice at this point, Paul is talking to religious people. These are the people who should know better. There are people who we proclaim good news to that, that we even might go into the conversation and say, they, they should know this. Like This should already be true. And yet we can become so surprised when it's not. There, there's a, a judgment that comes, and the judgment begins here. This prophecy speaks of judgment. So what is judgment, right? We look, look long view here of what's going on here. The judgment is the removal of God's hand of grace and his presence. Those who turn from God, or rather continue in their own way and refuse to turn to God, receive what they desire distance from him. Those who desire rebellion against God, God gives them over to their rebellion. Those who desire rejection of his love and life, he gives them over to themselves. This is how judgment begins. And away from his presence and away from his protection away from his grace and mercy, what is the judgment, what, what's the experience of that? No protection from the enemy. We see this over and over in the history of Israel. When Israel was stiff-necked towards Yahweh, he would give them over and the enemy would come in. Giving them over to what they want, that they would be consumed by their own desires. An exile. Removal from the land of promise, which is where God's presence resided. So it's not the land, it's God's presence that, that was being removed. And 
Just like the kingdom of God begins here, we get a taste of it as we live under the lordship of Jesus and his rescue through the cross and his forgiveness of sins. We live under his lordship beginning now and extends after his return, after his judgment into eternity. The same is true of judgment. There are those that experience judgment even now. And that judgment will extend into eternity upon his return, upon Christ's return, and upon his final judgment. Jesus has said, I have all authority in heaven and earth. He carries that authority to judgment. And we've talked about this before. There is an impending day when the door closes and there is no more choice. But the choices are made way back here. The choice for life or the choice for death. That which is tasted and, and, and experienced impartial here will extend into eternity. Jesus talks about this. Jesus describes eternity apart from hell. He does so in a variety of ways, but one of the, the main ways that we talk about it is, is, um, is it, with the word hell. Jesus describes life apart from God. That's what hell is. It's consuming. So sometimes the words that are used are, are fire. It's consuming. Consumed by desires and passions. We say desires and passions seem like a good thing. An unsatiated passion, an unsatiated lust, an unsatiated desire consumes the soul. We've tasted those things as our own desires run amok. The desire for, for pleasure will destroy and rip apart families. The, destroy, the, the, the desire for more turns into hoarding through greed and it destroys families, relationships, and communities. So the depiction we're given by Jesus is this consuming fire. Another word that's described as this is Gehenna. It was the garbage dump outside of the city where not only was trash burning, but unclaimed bodies would be thrown there to rot, be consumed in the fires that never went out and eaten by the worms. But a decaying body gets to a place where there is an end. The worms have no more to eat. But Jesus talks about being cast out into the place where the worms never die. It's this continual, that which has begun here continues into eternity. Separation from God is this place where we not only are consumed by the burning passions and desires that destroy us, but it's a death that goes on and on and on and on the worms feasting on corpses for all eternity. These are the pictures that were given in the choices that are made. That which has begun in part continues for eternity upon his return and upon his judgment. These are the things that are proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus as Paul proclaims it, as we share boldly and without hindrance. These are the things that are talked about in the scriptures and drawing us into, not for beating down, but for drawing into life, for continually holding out, choose this day who you will serve. Will you serve in humility the Lord Jesus Christ who has made the way of forgiveness through his sacrificial death and has overcome sin and death through his death and resurrection, where evil is stripped of its power and hell, its potency? Or will you choose to continue to serve self, which leads to the consuming fire and death, ultimately an eternal death apart from God? God will give those who desire to live apart from him, he will give them exactly what they desire. Hell is chosen here. Eternal life is chosen here. And this we proclaim. And our lives lived together in community are lived in such a way that we become a signpost of the kingdom of God. 
pointing people to life and flourishing and goodness under the lordship of Jesus. And so we see Paul proclaiming for two years in the place of house arrest, proclaiming the kingdom of God and the lordship of Jesus. He shared with anybody who would come and talk with him. And think about your life. There are those who certainly need to hear, no? Who are those that might come and sit and listen? It's hard to know sometimes, isn't it? Like we're not in chains. We're not just waiting for him to walk through the front door. We, we go, we, we're with, but we have a sense. Who's listening? Who has ears to hear? Who has eyes to see? Who has hearts that are soft? We don't know until it's proclaimed. And then we know by their response. Who are those that come with whom you might share? Shared boldly, clearly. There's so much beauty in what God is doing and has done in Christ. We get to share those things boldly and courageously. Not always preaching from a hillside, but through the words of encouragement and the acts of love, the ways that we move towards people, we share. I love just hearing somebody this last week um, was talking about uh, actually his, his, his wife who at work just has begun to ask people, hey, how can I pray for you? Right? It's opening doors, it's testing things, it's moving even courageously in that workspace and seeing what God will do. This is what it looks like to move boldly and without hindrance. Isn't that an interesting way to describe what's going on here? Because Paul had every hindrance. Shipwreck, snakes, chains. He had every hindrance, but he proclaimed it boldly without hindrance. Friends, you and I so quickly look at the things of our lives and consider it hindrance. Well, I can't. And hush, hush here. And I'm not sure there. And I don't have the answers here. We so easily succumb to hindrance, do we not? But as we follow God, as we live in the space, as we embrace the making of beautiful feet, beautiful are the feet of the ones who bring good news. This is who he is. This is what he is doing. And it doesn't stop with Paul. Let it be said of Center Point Church, they proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. The mission continues. The same spirit that empowered them way back here in Acts chapter 2 is the same spirit that lives in us. The same kingdom of God that was proclaimed there is the same kingdom of God. The same Jesus who reigned and ruled in that day is reigning and ruling in this day. And in this day, there are still those far and wide who have not heard. And the only way they will hear is through you, through us. As we pick up the baton, and run the race set before us with all boldness and without hindrance. So let's wrap up Acts with our big three, shall we? There's lots of things that have been percolating up through this whole thing, but let's just wrap it up with some big three here, all right? Very simply, we got our big three up on our screen here. Jesus is Lord. Boom, done. Like that's the, Jesus is Lord. He has overcome sin and death. He has overcome hard hearts through the power of his spirit. Jesus is Lord and his reign has begun. His reign continues and upon his return, it will be final and complete. But Jesus is Lord. It's not Jesus will be Lord. Jesus is Lord. And number two, nothing can stop 
God's mission? Nothing. Listen to this. I'm going to read, I want to read this quote. And this is uh, um, Steve Addison in a book called Acts and the Movement of God. Kind of fits with what we're talking about, right? It is rare for the movement of God to spread without suffering. The gospel moves, but never without pain. There is victory, but always through suffering. Paul learned to embrace his weakness and let God's power work through him. Suffering brought joy because he found Christ in his weakness. Yeah, you got that? So in the very moment that you're going, I don't got enough. I don't know enough of the answers. I don't know what to say. I don't have enough. Or but people kind of knew what I was really like. Like We come with empty pockets and God fills us. It's our weakness that, it, that God empowers on his mission. So we move forward without hindrance. And what do we do with this? We repent and believe. This is how we can... No new life. This is the choice that's before us. Choose this day, life or death. To choose life, to choose death, we must do nothing. Like that's that's the direction that we're all already going. We know how to be selfish. We know how to be self-serving. We know how to to grind in our own uh, passions and desires. We don't need anybody to teach us those things. But to choose life is about repentance and believing to set aside the selfish desires and the sin that entangles us through humble repentance and to believe, to walk forward in faith, faith in the salvation of Jesus and faith in the lordship of Jesus as we walk that out each day as he shapes himself in us. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand Repent and believe the good news. And that is our message here as well. And the mission continues. Let me pray. Jesus, uh, wow, you are Lord. And we bow before you in humility and in hearts of repentance for the ways that we have been stubborn the ways that we have been blind, the ways that we have been deaf by our own choices. Forgive us. Forgive us. And fill us with your life. That we might worship you and honor you and walk with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now, before I send you out, right, I got a little paid advertisement here, right? So a little paid advertisement. I, I need a little bit of help. Is Chloe still in the room over here? I got Chloe and I got Heidi and Scott. Thank you. Come on up here and help me real quick. And um, uh, Charlie, come here and help me real quick, all right? All right. Um, what, we, what, what these things are right here, and they're going to pass out for you. So you take a bunch over on that side and you two kind of hang out in the lobby over here. And Scott, you can kind of be in the lobby, kind of the door to the commons. And Charles, you just kind of hang out over here a little bit. And as people walk through, you just pass them these things, all right? So here's what this is. This is for you. This is a gift for you. It is a groups and teams scavenger hunt that you're going to want to win. There's like prizes and stuff. So you saw on the way and we got the tents out there. So those are a bunch of teams in the south wing are a bunch of groups. And, and particularly if you are not connected in the life of the church, today is your day. Because we are a church on the move. We are a part of the mission of Jesus and, and you need to be a part of it, right? And so we are set up to help you be a part of that today in a special way. So this is your scavenger hunt. Leave your name and email in order to get your prize. If you don't get your name, you don't get your email, you don't get the prize. And there's questions there that you will only get as you make your way around the tables and the tents, all right? So yes, you have to do it. There is no secret way for you to get answers without doing it. So stop and talk to some of the folks in your church. Even if you're not gonna sign up for their group or their team, stop and talk to them. This is your church, baby. Come and be a part of it and at least get to know some of the people around you. So hang out for a little bit, get your kids first and then hang out. We got some games and stuff out there, right? So this is our paid advertising. You're gonna get that on your way out. Excellent, stand with me if you would. 
Oh, beautiful feet. I hear them hitting the floor. This is going to be fantastic. Your feet are so beautiful. But I also know you might be here today and you have never made that decision to follow Jesus. And you've been following after your own desires and passions and you want life. You want the life that comes only through Jesus. Our prayer team up here would love to talk to you and pray with you. Prayer team out there at the tent would love to talk with you and pray with you. I would love to talk with you and pray with you so that you might know that new life. All right? Don't wait. Today is your day of choosing. Choose life and walk with him for Jesus is Lord and we are his and the mission continues. Walk in his grace, walk in his power and walk in the fullness of his love as you go. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week.